So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Harry Elliott. Design, the way we choose to provide technologies. 
In Europe, industrializing mass retrofits to net zero energy and streamlining their finance and soft costs is now getting cheap enough to finance almost entirely, probably entirely within a year, from the saved energy, while extending human life and improving humanity, health, and value. This whole retrofit, basically putting the industrialized reassembled tea coats around the house, has even been demonstrated to be installed in a single day by the law. Industry uses half the world's energy and electricity. My team's latest $40 or $50 billion worth of industrial grid science typically found about 30 to 60 percent energy savings on retrofit, paying back in a few years, and far outperforming the ground zone on the upper left, where most energy service companies deliver disintegrated design. Our new build projects sit generally found 40 to 90 percent savings with lower than normal capital costs. Just better pipe and duct design in factories or buildings, saving 80 or 90 percent of friction, could have fully deployed, save roughly half the world's coal fired electricity, with paybacks typically under a year in retrofit and instant in new building. To bring out friction, we simply use big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps, and to eliminate elbows and their friction, we lay out the pipes first, then the equipment laying out the supply pipes as if they were drains. We bend lines, not pipes. Similar logic can make cars several fold more efficient, making their labor electrification faster and cheaper. Most of the energy it takes to move a car is actually caused by its weight, and saving one unit of energy at the wheel saves another four or five and one even waste getting into the wheels, and therefore leverages five or six units of fuel savings in the tank. Now this carbon fiber electric car, which I drive, reportedly made money from the first unit of the assembly line six years ago. Its carbon fiber was paid for uh, by the avoided batteries from not having to haul around so much weight, and of course, fewer batteries recharge faster. The integrated design compounds safe weight much more than other automakers assume. The assembly is radically frugal. It eliminates the conventional body shop and paint shop. It's much better for workers. Uh, and the quadruple efficiency, equivalent to 1.7 meters per 100 kilometers, makes no compromises and brings many advantages for the driver. In heavy vehicles, my team helped Walmart structurally save half its fuel per case in a decade, including its hard logistics. But better technology alone can profitably make the U.S. heavy lorries at least three times more efficient, and airplanes three to five times, like these decade-old designs by Boeing, NASA, and MIT, since the country of the Plus, the oil and gas reserves on cell phones for competitive reasons look bigger than the reserves on vertical private reasons, putting oil owners even more at risk for market competition than for climate regulation. The cost, for example, of getting U.S. autos completely off oil has fallen from $18 per state barrel seven years ago to under $10 today, heading toward uh, less than zero in the next six years. So oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. With electricity as with fuels, both technology and design are moving efficiency into fast forward. Prior lighting improvements are being swept away as LEDs in each decade get 30 times more efficient, 20 times brighter, 10 times cheaper. What else changes this fast? Well, the rest of the energy transformation, modern renewables. LEDs backwards are PVs, photovoltaics, instead of changing electricity and light, they change light into electricity. Uh, solar and in aqua wind power costs have now plunged below the dash lines across the fossil fuels fed into U.S. power stations, often making old coal and gas and nuclear plants uneconomic just to operate. It's generally wise to sell customers what they want before someone else does. And electricity users are figuring out that they can buy fewer electrons, use them far more productively and timely, reduce their own, and even trade them with each other. Dutch customers can already buy renewable electricity directly from other customers on this peer-to-peer -peer website, 
of fun growing literally from the source. A friend of mine bought his electricity from the chap in the upper left photo because the price was right, and it's a really cute piglet. And we got a long handwritten Christmas card from his electricity supplier. What big utility can it dream of such a customer intimacy? Indeed, powerful disruptors are converging on the electricity industry from at least eight directions. And these eight Pac-Men of the apocalypse don't just get, they exponentiate. They're not lone wolves, they hunt in packs, they multiply quickly, and they can gobble half of the utility revenue in the 2020s. Together, they're quickly creating an alien competitive landscape faster than most utility cultures can learn and adapt, and even as more Pac-Man come pouring over the hill. In the past two years, for example, the modern renewables have supplied upwards of two-thirds of the world's total net emissions of generating capacity, thanks to their powerful business case. U.S. wholesale electricity prices now widely exceed the average long-term fixed prices both of wind power and of solar power. In unsubsidized global markets, renewables average below $30 a megawatt hour in the diamonds keep falling through $20 towards $10. By next year, renewables will beat fossil fuels in every major region on Earth. And indeed, if you think storage is required, uh, median Colorado bids already did that six quarters ago, even including uh, storage, as shown by the filled squares. Photovoltaic and wind power output do vary, requiring careful grid balancing. But of the 10 ways to do that, the costliest giant batteries don't actually look necessary. Consider, for example, the difficult case of the state of Texas, whose grid has no big hydro dams and is not connected to the rest of the United States. A 2050 summer week's expected loads in Texas can get perhaps smaller and less peaky with profitably efficient use. Then we can make 86% of the annual electricity with wind plus solar cells and 14% from dispatchable renewables. This 100% renewable supply can then match the load by putting the surpluses into two kinds of distributed storage that are worth by anyway, ice storage, air conditioning, and smart charging of electric autos, and then recovering that energy when needed and filling the last gaps with unobtrusively flexible demand. So then you have 100% renewable electricity every hour of the year with no bulk storage and with only about 5% left over. So the economics should be excellent even at today's prices. Some grid operators do such a choreography today. Britain, Italy, Germany are all about one third renewably powered. But four other European countries with modest or no hydropower are meeting about half to three fourths of their electricity needs from renewables, adding no bulk storage. And with superior reliability, in fact, in Denmark and Germany, it's, it's about uh, 10 times US reliability. So these operators have learned to run the grids uh, the way the conductor leads the symphony orchestra. No uh, instrument plays all the time, but the ensemble together creates continuously. Music. Grid integration gets even easier with smart bi-directional hookups of parked battery electric cars. Last year, China sold more electric vehicles than the world sold the year before. Next year, the world will have up to 200 electric vehicle models, and that's because of added causes plummeting battery prices a decade faster than expected. In about five more years, electric cars will cost no more to buy than today's petrol cars. Abundant cheap batteries imply distributed solar everywhere, gas industry distress, the end of thermal power plants, vast distributed storage and event flexibility, and perhaps much of the grids becoming a stranded asset by phone company copper. This prospect gives utility executives nightmares and venture capitalists sweet dreams. Meanwhile, efficient and electric autos are morphing from pigs personal internal combustion of gasoline still nominated vehicles to SEALs, shareable electric autonomous lightweight service vehicles. Those two changes in technology and three changes in business model are all simultaneous, mutually reinforcing, vigorously played, and sped by smart policies 
and deep commercial ambitions in both India and China. Now, assembling all these opportunities, our 2011 business book, Reinventing Fire, rigorously showed how to treble the United States energy efficiency and quintuple its renewables by 2050, needing no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, at least a third less natural gas, while saving $5 trillion, growing the economy 2.6-fold, strengthening national security, and cutting fossil carbon emissions by 82 to 86 percent, yet needing no new inventions, no new national laws, but with smart city and state policies led by business for profit. And indeed, the first eight years of this four-year journey are nicely on track, green actual versus blue proposed, because the private sector has spent the $5 trillion on the table. That's exactly what should be happening. These best buys are also the most effective solutions to the big global problems that hazard every country's security and prosperity. And if you like any of Reinventing Fire's outcomes, you can support this transition without needing to like every outcome or agree which outcome is most important. To get consensus, just focus on outcomes, not motives. Now, stimulated by those U.S. findings at the G20 three years ago, China's National Development and Reform Commission published its roadmap for China's energy revolution. It details how China can save about th over $3 trillion, use energy seven times more productively, emit 42% less carbon and burn 80% less coal in a seven-fold bigger economy, and get 13 times more GDP from each ton of fossil carbon. This roadmap strongly informed the 13th Biden plan whose energy offers for our steering committee. Extrapolating those on-track U.S. adopted Chinese and similar European findings to the other half of the world could achieve the Paris Agreement's two-degree climate target, about $18 trillion cheaper. Uh, <clears throat> and reinvesting then some of that in natural systems carbon removal could then reach one and a half degrees with trillions of dollars left over and huge progress on the sustainable development goals. Making climate protection not costly but profitable should also simplify the politics. Climate science models conservatively understated the speed and runaway potential of climate change. Climate policy models conservatively understated what we could do to stop climate change. Offsetting those two biases, what Jeremy Grantham calls the race of our lives is very much on. Despair and complacency are equally unwarranted. In fact, the past three years of energy savings plus carbon free supply growth average just the pace that we must sustain for two degrees, or half the pace needed for one and a half degrees. And these energy transformations can flip markets with threat they can speed. And on Fifth Avenue in New York, in 1900, you have to look hard for the first car. Just 13 years later, you have to look harder the last horse. The horse and buggy industry thought it had many decades to adapt, but Ford's Model T car got 62% cheaper in 13 years. Car owning households soared from 8 to about 60% in a decade. Three fourths financed by General Motors and DuPont innovation called car loans. Today's solar modules just got 80% cheaper in five years. Three fourths of our rooftop solar is innovated in finance. And Ford's and Edison's industries are emerging to eat Rockefeller's industry. So the pace of transformation is set not by incumbents but by insurgents who are not inhibited by incumbents' business models, legacy assets, or cultures. Moreover, investors flee before customers do because capital markets keenly sniff out disruption. And once they think you're in or even headed for the toaster, they don't wait for the toast to get done before they decapitalize you and invest in your successors. Already about $8 trillion have proven to be fled the fossil fuel industries. One last thought. The energy transformation I've summarized is not just fundamental, it's elemental. The first industrial revolution in the Great New Britain was the age of carbon, creating our prosperity and the world's mightiest industries from coal and oil and gas. But now that obsolete age of carbon is giving way modern age of silicon. Silicon microchips, telecoms, and software turn people from isolated to network, systems from dumb to smart, grids from analog to digital, and potentially perhaps from the energies 
to democratize. <coughs> Silicon power electronics make electricity more convertible and precisely applicable, replacing fiery molecules with irradiant electrons. And silicon solar cells enable the ascent of energy from mining the fires of hell to harvesting the breath and radiance of heaven. So our responsibility and opportunity is to help enable the new energy system not protect the old, so the global energy transformation can move at the pace and cost of design and of software, not of infrastructure, and can be not constrained by the inertia of incumbents, but sped by the addition of insurgents.